you know, as we were doing those songs and thinking about uh, asking the Lord to bring new wine out of me, uh, is that something that we're willing to do through the crushing and, and through the pressing? And uh, I had a friend that, that he's passed away now, but is a minister, and, and he used to say that, that we've got to be willing to be broken bread and poured out wine. And, and it was an interesting thought to uh, uh, and Jesus, when he took the bread and he broke it, and he said, this represents my body that is broken for you. And, and then he took the, the juice and he says, this is the, the new covenant. Okay, and, and in Luke chapter 22, verse 20, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. And in Matthew chapter 26, 28, Jesus said the same thing, and, and Matthew wrote, and Matthew said, for this is, is what Jesus said, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And we know as we study the Old Testament, without the shedding of blood, there was no remission of sin. Okay, and, and one of the things that I've been studying <laughs> for a huge part of my life is on the covenant. And whenever you study the word covenant, you'll find out that there's 300 times that covenant is listed in the Old and New Testaments. And, and whenever you get to the New Testament, it is actually recorded, the word covenant is recorded 33 times. And, and whenever you look at the meaning of numbers and you look at the meaning of things, three means perfect completion and 30 means acts of redemption. So it is perfect completion of the redemption. Okay, when Jesus came... And he brought the new covenant. When you study in the Old Testament, most people agree that there were four covenants. We had the covenant that God gave Noah, that he would never destroy the earth again. We had the, the covenant that he gave Abraham. We had the, that, that he would be his God. He would make a great nation out of him. And he would bless him. Then we had the, the covenant of Moses. And last week we talked about the Mosaic Covenant. We talked about some of those things that happened when, when God gave him the Torah. He gave him the Ten Commandments and, and he gave man orders and rules to follow. And so we've got those covenants. And then we had the Davidic Covenant, the David Covenant of David. And, and God told David, he said, there'll always be a man in, in your lineage that will be the ruler. And we know that as we study, we find that Jesus came and he brought the fifth covenant that, that mainly Bible talks about is, is those five covenants. And so as I've studied on covenant, it's been really interesting the path that it's taken me in the last few weeks and months that I've been looking back over covenant. And so today what I want to talk to you about is rediscovering the covenant of God. Okay, as we rediscover the covenant of God, we want to go back and we want to review it and we want to look at what God promised us in that new covenant. As we look at the Old Testament, we find that, that throughout Scripture, they told us there was a new and a better covenant that was coming. In Jeremiah chapter 31, let's begin with that one. In Jeremiah chapter 31, i got to get my readers out so I can see nowadays. Can any of y'all relate to that? Mm, yeah. Okay, in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. And the heading for this chapter is a new covenant. And it says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Okay, that's talking about the Mosaic covenant. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Okay, the new covenant that God is bringing is a covenant that all of our sins, past, present, and future, they're going to be under the blood of Jesus, and no longer will our sins be remembered. Why? Because they're under the blood of Jesus. The shedding of His blood was for the remission of sins. 
Then if you go over to Ezekiel, and in Ezekiel, he talks about that, that same covenant. He, he mentions the same thing. Let me see if I can find this. This is Ezekiel chapter 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. When we begin, Keith made a comment about a scripture that I use over and over, and I've used it for many years, and it's out of Zechariah chapter 7, verse 11. And it says that God spoke to them, and He told them to bring justice. And it says that they said this is hard saying, and they plugged their ears, they shrugged their shoulders, and they refused to heed the voice of the Lord. Well, here we have God speaking to us, and He telling us there's a new covenant that's going to come along. And it's not about following a set of rules and regulations, It's about receiving Christ for the remission of your sins. Jesus said, it's the the covenant in my blood. He shed his blood for us. And so, well, what is a covenant? Well, when you're studying Webster's Dictionary and he talks about covenant, it, it says that it's an agreement. Well, the agreements that we have nowadays don't mean anything. They're not worth the paper they're written on. The contracts... They're not worth the paper they're written on because you can get out of them. There's loopholes. But this is, uh, what he says is about a covenant is that it's something that is binding. It's legal. It's something that is everlasting. It's something that is eternal. It's a solemn, a formal, and binding agreement. Today, we talk about a covenant with God, and it's something that's very seldom talked about it's something that's very seldom shared when i do a wedding i talk to the couple that's that i'm doing the wedding for and sadie and i counsel with them and we talk to them about covenant that what they are coming into is a covenant the marriage the wedding is the closest thing that you and i have to a covenant that represents what god has done for you and i he told us that his church is his bride And he tells us that he is the head and we are the body. He tells us that he's coming back for a pure bride without spot and without wrinkle. Okay, and so those are things that he talks about us. And so when couples enter into a marriage and say, and I share with them about covenant and how important a covenant is. And those of you that heard me talk about a covenant all through the years, what I discovered in a covenant is they took an animal and they split it down the middle, pulled it apart, And then the two parties stood in the middle of it. There had to be a shedding of blood to ratify the covenant. To say this is legal. This is binding. This is the agreement. And when the two parties stood in it, they said, If either one of us breaks this covenant, may this same thing happen to me. Are we... Feeling that way toward God and the covenant that God has given us? Are we very flippant about our relationship with Him and about the covenant with Him? When our nation was founded over 430 years ago, whenever they wrote and they did the Mayflower Compact and some of the other, the Puritans came and some of the things that they wrote and some of the things that they said, uh, like John Winthrop, he said, We have an explicit covenant with Almighty God. We have an explicit covenant with Almighty God. Does our nation still feel that way, that we have an explicit covenant with Almighty God? Today we see more and more chaos going on around about us. But what I'm interested in is what is going on in the church of the living God those who claim to be sons and daughters of the Most High God. Do we understand that we have a covenant, an explicit covenant with Almighty God? It is an eternal covenant. It is an everlasting covenant. Do we have that understanding? Do we have that comprehension? How many of y'all ever been told by someone, man, I'm here for you. Come hell or high water, I'm here. Well, you look around and you wonder, well, was it high water or was it hell? What was it that got them? Because we don't 
make that commitment. We don't make that covenant in marriage to where no matter what, I'm going to be faithful and true to you. No matter what may come, no matter how hard it gets, I'm here no matter what. As I studied uh, on, on teaching people about marriage, and as Sadie and I went through a marriage problems 30 years ago, I studied every book I could get on every teacher that talk about, taught on relationships. I dug into it. And one of the things that I found within every one of those books, that they talked to the men and they said, man, you've got to make your wife understand and know that you are not leaving. You are here for the duration. That you are going to be here. Hell or high water. You're here for them. Do we have that same deal? You know, I deal a lot of counseling with young couples. And I see in those young couples, they don't have an understanding of that. Well, if this doesn't work, I'll find me another one. I'll just go through it again. We've got to return to God. And in returning to God, if we follow throughout the things that went through Scripture and we find what Israel did when they would return to God, we see that every 400 years they would fall away and they get in bondage and then they would cry out to God. They would return to Him and they'd say, Deliver us, God. And so one thing they'd always do is they would repent. Then they would restore temple worship. But before they restored the temple worship, they had to re-cleanse the temple. They had to get out all the idols and all the things in it. They had to, to rededicate the temple to the Lord. They had to renew the covenant or restore the covenant that they had with God. I believe that we in the church of the living God, I believe that we've got to return to God through repentance. When we repent and we cry out to God and we say, Father, reveal anything within me that is not pleasing to you. Am I not following through with that covenant with you? Am I not following through? Well, how? In every area of your life. Every walk of life. Because everything that you do or you say, He said that you're to do it and say it as unto Him rather than the man. So I'm representing Him because I am in covenant with Him. So it's very important what I say, what I do, how I act, how I react. Do you have a different act that you put on when you attend a building on Sunday mornings and claim to be going to church? Do you act different? Do you dress different? Do you talk different? When you walk out the door on Monday morning to go to the business world, to go into the world, how do you act? How do you react? How do you talk? How do you do the things that you do? Do you remember I am in a covenant with Almighty God? It is an explicit covenant with Him. Jesus gave His life for me, and so I'm going to walk worthy of Him in everything I say and do. I'm going to follow Him in every area of my life. Am I interested in the covenant that God talks about? When you look at these scriptures of Jeremiah and Ezekiel, then you go to the New Testament, you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, then he begins to explain the whole new covenant. He begins in, in chapter 3, let's begin with verse 7, or let's begin with verse 4, I'm sorry. And we have such trust through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. If you can get out of that, get a hold of that, then understand. Without God, you can do nothing. But with God, all things are possible. In and through God, you can do all things. You can walk worthy of Him. You can walk as He walked. You can talk as He talked because your sufficiency comes from Him. You're in a covenant with Almighty God. And in the new covenant, He says, I'm giving you a promise. And the promise is the third person of the Holy Spirit is going to come and He's going to live within you. He is going to guide you into all truth. By His divine power, He's going to give you everything that pertains to life and to godliness. So our sufficiency is from Him. So we've got to settle that within us, that our sufficiency is not of ourselves. It's not by might nor by our, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. Then He goes to 
verse 6, and he says, Who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. He's talking about the Old Testament of laws, of rules, regulations, all of those old covenants. It was about following a law, following a legal system. And now he says that you're under grace. You're under the Spirit. And the Spirit gives life, but the law brings death. Verse 7, But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses, because of the glory of His countenance, which glory was passing away, how would the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? What he is saying, Moses got to go and be in God's presence when he handed him those Ten Commandments, and when he came back down, he was glowing that the people couldn't even look upon him, and he had to put a veil over his face. Well, now he says the ministry of the Spirit is to be much more glorious so what is he saying he's saying that everywhere you go the spirit of the living god is living within you and so people ought to see jesus in you they ought to see the spirit of living god in you why because it's a covenant i will never leave you i will never forsake you there's nothing you can do that can separate yourself from me So when I begin to look at this covenant and I begin to look at all the things that the covenant means, I've got to understand that this ministry of the Spirit is going to be much more glorious than that ministry of the law. Verse 9, for at the ministry of condemnation, okay, the law condemns. It had glory. The ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. So what's he telling us? He's telling us that the law is passing away, but the Spirit and the life of the Spirit is eternal. He tells us that the Ten Commandments were glorious. The law was glorious, but the Spirit is more glorious. He tells us the law represented death. It represented condemnation. But the Spirit represents life. It represents liberty. So if we're going to walk in the Spirit, then we've got to understand that because of the covenant, it is a 24-7 covenant. It doesn't change. I've got to act the same way out there as I act in here. I've got to be willing to walk worthy of Him. Okay? Verse 12, therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away, but their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. Why? Because we're all filled with the Spirit. We all have that glory of the Lord. We all have that expectation to walk as he walked, talk as he talked. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. This is one that... (laughs) that Whenever I show this, and I've showed this for the last 30 years of my life, this is one that people really struggle with. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. We are being transformed. How? By glory to glory. The more that you're in the presence of the Lord, the more that you read and study His Word, the more that you understand that covenant that He has made with us. More and more we understand what He's talking about. In Romans 8, 2, He says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Because there was a law that told you about everything you were doing wrong. 
It was always shame on you. It was always pointing at the wrong. But now we point to the covenant. One of the greatest stories I think we have in the Bible, and one of the favorite stories I have in the Bible, is when David, a young shepherd boy, met Goliath. David recognized the covenant that he had with Almighty God, come out of the same mama, same, he had the same, he had the same, I guess he had the same mama and daddy. But he had brothers that were at war. And as they come to the battle, they were all afraid of Goliath. But David recognized one thing. And you can read this in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And as you begin to go through it and you begin to, to read through it, you'll see two times David says, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? And then two times he says, Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? I would ask you today, is there not a cause in the United States of America for God's sons and daughters to rise up understanding the covenant that they have with Him? It is an explicit covenant. Is it an eternal covenant? And that we are to represent Him in all things, in all areas, in all places. Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Twice David said, is there not a cause? Twice David said, who is this uncircumcised? He was giving his brothers an opportunity because they were raised by the same person. They had that same upbringing. And he was giving them an opportunity. Who is this uncircumcised? Guys, that guy's uncircumcised. We have a covenant with God. And God is going to do it. God is going to one that's going to kill him. God is the one that's going to deliver us. Because we have a covenant with Almighty God. When I read that story, we got to stand on the mountain in Israel, looking over the Ella Valley where it all took place. And one young man recognized out of all of the soldiers, out of the king, out of them all, he recognized Goliath is uncircumcised. He does not have a covenant. We have a covenant. It is an everlasting covenant. When the covenant was ratified, there was not an animal that was split in two. Jesus was the one that died. And He shed His blood. And God ratified the covenant Himself for you and I. That we are in covenant. We are in covenant. As I was studying this and as I was going through the covenant, and all of a sudden, those of y'all been listening to me, you know that March the 26th of 2021, they fell in two new Dead Sea Scrolls. When they found the New Dead Sea Scrolls, Satan and I, both of our attitude was, what is God saying today? Throughout Hebrews, he says, today, hear my voice. Today, if God allows them to find two New Dead Sea Scrolls in March of 2021, he is speaking to every one of his sons and daughters. And he is reminding them of the covenant. And he is speaking loudly. And the scripture that they could read in the cave was was Zechariah chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. And very plainly, God says, Stop lying to one another. Bring truth, justice, and peace into your gates. Into your arena of influence. Into your home. Into your work. Into everywhere that you go. You are in covenant with Almighty God, and so you're going to have to walk in truth. When you go and you study and you find in Zechariah 8 that he talks about this same covenant. In Deuteronomy 8, 8, he says that there's a day coming and I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my sons and daughters. And it's going to be a covenant that is based in truth and in righteousness. Did you know that your righteousness, did you know that my righteousness stinks before the Lord? But it's His righteousness. 
Because he made a covenant with you and I. And that covenant says that we are to increase and we're to be conformed from glory to glory. We're to move from glory to glory. We're to be as he was on this earth. And how are we able to do that? Because his glory lives within us. His manifested spirit, his manifested presence, his manifested goodness, his manifested power, that glory of the Lord is what you and I are supposed to take out in the world. Why? Because we have a covenant with Almighty God. As I go through this and I look and, and I look what he says in Zechariah 8.8, 8, he says, I will bring them back and they will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. They shall be my people and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. Then you turn a few pages to Zechariah chapter 13 verse 9. In, in Zechariah chapter 13 verse 9, he says, I will bring the one-third through the fire. I will refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people, and each one will say, the Lord is my God. The word refine means to melt, to refine, to test, to purify. It's metal and refining, whether literal or figurative, to prove, to melt, to examine, to try by fire. The verb which occurs more than 30 times refers to that melting process whereby impurities are removed from precious metals such as gold or silver. David beseeches God in Psalms 26 too, and he says, God, try me and refine me as fire. I told you at the beginning of this year that I believe that we're at a season in a place that God was refining his sons and daughters. And that if you wanted all that God has for you, then you need to say, Father, baptize me with your Holy Spirit and fire. And the refiner's fire is here. Why? To reveal things that are hidden. Reveal attitudes. Reveal actions. Reveal things that are not pleasing to the Lord. Reveal those things that my wife tells me, whatever that was that jumped on you was not very becoming of a son of the Most High God. Those are the things that God will reveal to us. And as He reveals them, then we are the ones that shakes that stuff off. We're the ones that removes those things from our lives. We're the ones that are not conformed to the world, but we're transformed. How? By the renewing of our mind. How? By recognizing them th things and doing away with them. As I look through this covenant and I study, and all of a sudden I see the correlation and I see the footnotes that go back to Zechariah. Y'all, we're in a place that we have to return to the Lord in a place of, of allowing Him to reveal those things in us, to remove those things, to refine us. Well, why is that? Because in the new covenant, God says, I'm coming back for a pure bride without spot and without wrinkle. I've showed you over and over that He says, heaven must retain Christ until transformation of all things and uh, until the restoration of all things. The church has to be restored to the former glory to where it's even a greater glory. And so for me, as, I, as I'm studying on the, the covenant and I'm looking at these things, there's some things that the covenant, it is explicitly with God Almighty. What right does an unbeliever does a son and a daughter of Most High God, what right do you have to be messing in darkness? What right does a son and daughter of God have to be hanging out with things of the darkness? Simple question. Simple question. If we're going to walk in that covenant, and he says the covenant, this relationship between me and my sons and daughters, it's going to be a relationship that is based in truth and righteousness. My righteousness stinks. My righteousness is from God. He says that if I will embrace that righteousness, 
He says that he will give me grace that is exceedingly abundantly above and beyond anything that I can even imagine. Because where sin abounds, his grace much more abounds. And so I've got to be willing to embrace that my righteousness is from him. It is not because of whatever I do, whatever I say, whatever I give. It's not about those things. It's about believing in Christ and Him crucified. It's about us understanding that we have a covenant in Almighty God. He tells us that in in Romans 3.20, He said, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in God's sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. And so what He's telling us It's not about what we do. It's about have we received Christ. And if we've received Christ, then we are in covenant with Almighty God. And if we are in covenant with Almighty God, then we've got to walk in truth and in righteousness. We've got to be willing to recognize. I believe that we have to recognize it is an eternal covenant. Years ago, I used to say, well, the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it. And one day I said that, and very plainly I heard the voice of the Lord, and He said, how arrogant are you? It doesn't matter if you believe it or not. I'm the one that settled it. So we see, it doesn't even matter if I believe it. It's already settled because it is an eternal covenant. It is everlasting and is the explicit covenant with Almighty God. Do we recognize that? 400 years ago, 430 years ago, our nation was founded with those thoughts and with those desires that we have an explicit covenant. I think we've turned away from those thoughts and those desires. So in the words of David, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? That is why I believe that every one of God's sons and daughters have got to be willing to go out of the building. I believe that is why institutional church, business as usual, must change. I believe we got to understand that because of the covenant, I have to be willing to go out. And when I go out, then I am his representative. In Isaiah 2 2, he says, The mountain of the Lord will be over all other mountains. And so instead of us separating ourselves and going to a building that we call church, let's understand we don't attend church. We is the church. We is the church. Why? Because we have an explicit covenant with the Almighty God. And it is an eternal covenant. He's not going to make another covenant. This was the final covenant that He ratified with the death of His Son. So we've got to recognize that. Father, I thank You for this Word. And as we study and we look into the covenant, Father, the more I dig into it and the more I study, the more that I see how the Scriptures tie together throughout the Old and the New Testament. And I see how you're speaking to us. And so, Father, I just ask, give us ears to hear what your Spirit has to say, what you are saying to your sons and daughters. What is it that you're speaking to us? I just thought of a scripture. Hebrews chapter 8. He's, Hebrews is where he, he talked about today, if you'll hear his voice, he tells us about the ministry of Melchizedek, the eternal covenant. In Hebrews chapter 8. 
Beginning with verse 1. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. Guess where that eternal, what did I say? This is the temple, not created with hands. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and the shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also the mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. That comes straight out of Jeremiah 31. So we have a better covenant. And it is eternal. There is not going to be another one. He's not going to make a new covenant with those who attend Sunday morning services. It's with those sons and daughters that have received him and received his spirit. Amen? Amen. 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 You got anything? You got anything? You got anything, Keith? Yeah, come on. Well, you know, it's been driven home in our brains, you know, do not forsake the gathering of yourselves together. You know, it's like, oh, you got to be at that church building, you know. But when you realize that you are God's representative, you are the household of God everywhere you're at. Yes, we need to come together. Yes, we need to, you know, be trained and equipped and all those things and obey the scriptures. But... I mean, how many of you in this room are in business, or you're a teacher, or you're a nurse, or, or whatever it is you do in life, everywhere you're at, you are that representative of Christ. So when we talk about going into the seven mountains of influence, that's your mountain of influence God has you in. Whether that's you're where a, you bring truth, justice. Yes, that's where you bring the earth. presence of God. Yep. So like even if you're, you're a hairdresser or whatever, people will give you a window in their life. And if they express a hurt, if they express a concern, that is your window of opportunity right there to pray with them. And usually if they're going to let down that door enough to give you that window, they're needing it really no. bad. And that is your opportunity to take them to the Father to minister to them as you, you know don't be religious about it you know you got to understand where they're at you know I, I believe god will give you discernment in that moment but that is your window of to show love like if they're really needing some money because they don't have groceries well the word says doesn't say call the church you are the church mm -hmm. if you have some money that you can help them buy groceries you do it mm -hmm. You do it. Don't go to the local church to do it. And just be aware of that because I, God has blessed me with a business. And people, when they open that door of opportunity, I immediately say, well, let's pray. Can I pray with you? And they're so ready. And the Spirit of the Lord comes and tears will just fall. Because God is ministering to them. And I'm, I want to encourage each and every one of you. You're the same. We are to be Jesus in this earth. And I just want to encourage you, that's wherever God's got you, you are that influence. Amen. 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 Thank you all so much for being here. And I hope you take time to study on the covenant that we have. If he mentions it 30 times, that's something that, that we need to look at. And if it's mentioned 33 times and three is perfect completion and, and 30 reps of his redemption, for me, that jumps off the pages that it says God speaking it, that this is the, the final perfect completion of redemption is us understanding the covenant that we have with Almighty God. Amen.
Thank you. Thanks for watching this week's message. If you would like to partner with us financially or support our ministry, text the code Kingdom Life to 94000 or visit our website, cmjacksboro.com.